Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Salon Marketing Live. I'm Stephanie Mitchell, and I'm so excited to have special guest Dawn Bradley with us here today. Hi, Dawn. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. This is so exciting. It's the final Salon Marketing Live of the year, so end of December. And of I the think decade. Of the decade. Of the decade, guys. <laughs> and I'm so excited to have you here with us because this is something that is like, I feel like a really good topic to round out the year and kind of like looking forward to 2020 and how we can be better and improve in our businesses. And um, Dawn is going to chat with us all about the topic that she is so clearly passionate about, which is building up confidence, um, managing anxiety, and building up your client base through those kind of like positive and confidence building activities. And I'm so, so, so happy to have you here. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and introduce yourself for, um, for people who aren't familiar with you, who don't know you. Uh, I'm Don Bradley. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I've been in the hair industry for 18 years, which is crazy to me because yeah. I feel like I'm still 18 years old. Um, <laughs> I started going into the industry just for something to do. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be a serious career move or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting some really amazing opportunities within the first like five to seven years of my career, traveled overseas, lived in the UK and Australia, opened up my own salon in 2010, um, wow. packed everything up at the end of 2014 and moved to Calgary and restarted at the end of 2014 in Calgary uh, and then started my independent education. And now I coach and mentor other hairstylists how to run biz their businesses better through all of the trial and error that I've done over the last 18 years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, you do not look old enough to have been in the beauty industry for 18 years. Thank you. Um, um, you look amazing. But also, can you just tell us like, um, right now in your business, what does it look like? So are you're still doing hair, like you're still working in your salon and you're kind of like splitting your time between coaching and working in the salon too? Um, I'm not really in the salon much. I'm there for a few of my long-term clients, but mm -hmm. I'm there very, very part-time. Um, my business is 100% pouring into the lives of other salon owners, um, hairstylists, and, and independent educators. Right. Okay. Awesome. So do you have a, a team of people that are essentially there working with you? What's your team like at your business? Uh, well, because I kind of have like two sides of my business. I have like the salon business yeah. and then I have my coaching business. Um, so I have a couple, I have a chair renter at my salon. Um, I have admin help. And then I also in my online business have like a whole team of people working behind the scenes yeah. of things for my business. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's so great that you've, I mean, that you've been in the industry for so long. You've seen so many things and what mm -hmm. is it that you're so passionate about helping beauty businesses with nowadays in their business? What are like the main things that you focus on to help your clients? Well, the thing that I've seen happening is the rise of people becoming their own bosses, which is so exciting because there are so many talented and skilled hairstylists mm -hmm. out there. But what I'm seeing is that they are talented and skilled in hair and they don't really know how to run a successful business and they end up running themselves into the ground. And I did this post on Instagram a while ago being like, um, your lack of boundaries is not a form of excellent customer service. Mm -hmm. And I think I really hit like a pain point for people because that used to be me where I thought like staying late or working extra, like, oh, look at me, I'm doing everything for my clients. Like my, I'm giving the most excellent customer service when really I had no boundaries yeah. and it was fine in the beginning. And I have, I have hairstylists push back, be like, well, Don, that's different for me. Like I can work 60 hours a week. And I'm like, cool, give me a call in a couple of years. Cause I was able to maintain it for almost four years as well. Yeah. I would get sick a lot. And then I started to resent the reason why I loved my job in the first place. Like I love the connection with my clients. I love being able to make women know and feel their worth and feel beautiful from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to resent those people and I started to feel frustrated and I blamed them for a long time when really it was me. No, I taught them how to treat me and I didn't have the proper boundaries and I overworked myself and I got overwhelmed and yeah. because I really loved what I did, but I forgot about how to run a business well. And then I didn't allow myself to be a good business owner because I still lived under this belief that I'm just a hairstylist. Right. And as much as I hated that people put that on me, I still played it out being like, well, I can't learn that. I'm no good at bookkeeping, but it's because I'm a hairdresser. And I'd laugh about Yeah. Oh, 
John, you just cut out. Oh, sorry, we're back again. Sorry, I can okay, hear you back. now. Okay. So you okay, said that I'm you would laugh. Hair. You would laugh about the fact that, um, like, you you said, "Oh, I'm not good at bookkeeping," but it's because I'm a hairdresser. Yeah, and as much as like I hate that people would put that label on me, I lived out that label, and I used it as excuse to keep myself from growing and mm-hmm. keep it, myself becoming better. And I kept myself in this place where like I was loving the money I was making because I was basically working two full time jobs. Like I was working so much, yeah. and I was like, this income is great. And then I had a major bout of of anxiety where I end up in the hospital and I was like I want to maintain this income but I need to change my habits and so I started to work smarter not harder and like was able to maintain my income while not pushing myself so hard and I had this huge aha of like for the longest time I thought I was oh yeah you're here you're here okay for the longest time I thought I was only worth the money I was making if I was working hard and I was tired and I was right. exhausted and realizing like, that's not, that's not how we have to be. And I have multiple students. I just got a message from a student the other day being like, I didn't work any extra this December and I've already doubled my income from last December. Wow. So that's pretty cool. It's like so rewarding. Yeah, I bet. So what kind of things are you teaching them? And like, what have you learned in your own business? Like after you had that kind of like anxiety break of like, I can't keep doing this. Like what kind of changes did you make in your own business that started to change? Like you said, working smart instead of hard. Yeah, I think I just realized, like, I needed to start showing up to work like it was work. Like, I got into this place where I'm like, I just have the best job, and it's so fun, and I get to hang out and gab with my friends, they feel like, they they are my friends, they've become my friends, that I forgot to view it as work. I was like, I get paid to just hang out with people, which is awesome. Like, we have a really amazing job that way. However, I was losing out on so much opportunity of if I remembered, I could still keep it fun. I could still have that connection with them. But there was a lot of income opportunities I was missing out on because I wasn't showing up with the fact that I was there to work as right. well. Yeah. So that was one of the key things is I needed to reframe, like, how serious am I taking this? Um, like, it doesn't need to be like, I don't friends or whatever with my client, but how can I be intentional about the missed opportunities that are passing me by. Like my client, I remember a client once being like, so yeah, I totally forgot to pick up shampoo. So I just went to chatters in the mall and being like, cool, like uh, no problem. But like, shoot, if I would have reminded them, they would have bought it with me. Or if I would have even taught my clients like, Hey, actually when you buy from me, like that helps my business. And it also helps. I always say to people, it helps keep my prices where they're at because if you support me through the, your, you're going to have to buy shampoo any, any time. Anyways, if you support me that way, it actually keeps the cost down because my business is bringing in more income. Yeah, yeah. So essentially it was like you taking yourself seriously as a business person. It's like putting yeah. in certain things in place in your business that are like treating it not just as like a job that you go into every day, but something that's like you're growing and it's an actual business instead of like just your passion. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I say that and I don't want people, anyone to listen to be like, well, I don't want that. But like, it's not, it actually hasn't created more work for me. It's created Mm -hmm. less work because I have a set schedule. And when my client says like, oh, but Don, I really need my hair done. I'm like, and there's times where I've bent the rules, but now I'm like, I understand. And I so want to get you in. But if if I squeeze you in, I won't do the quality of work that I, that you're used to and that I want to give you. Yeah. And so, yeah, I could squeeze you in, but it's going to result in not the quality. And I can't give you that because I care about how your hair turns out. It's just not about getting you in. It's about yeah. what it turns out. And then it educates them and they understand like, oh, okay. And at the end of my day, but I'm already working 10 hours that day. And so I know that if I do that one, I'm going to miss, I don't have kids, but lots of people, I'm going to miss putting my kids to bed or, or my kids commitment. Like I, I made that commitment to them and I need to stick to that. Mm-hmm. But also if I fit you in at the end of a 10 hour day, you're not going to want me to do your hair. Yeah, it's true. It, I mean, you have a totally different like attitude and energy at the end of 10 hours. Jeez. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing that I help empower um, hairstylists with is realizing like you can say no, but it's not just about like, no, I'm not fitting you in. It's about like, I always say lead with kindness, compassion, and empathy. Like mm-hmm. I get it. I really want you to get in before the new year as well. Like, yeah. and I'm so bummed out that I won't be able to know that because I really love doing your hair. I love having you in. But if I try to fit you in outside of my schedule, I'm going to break commitments with other people and I'm also not going to do my best work. And I can't do that to you. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds so, like a big part of your like growth and journey has been a lot of, like you said, like setting up boundaries. 
Yeah, boundaries and learning how to commute commute <laughs> communicate properly, effectively, and openly. Because I think that's such a huge I don't know, I want to say epidemic in our society with like texting and stuff, is we don't communicate fully and then we make assumptions. Mm. And then there's so much miscommunication happening. But if we just let people know, this is another, so these are like my key phrases, kindness, compassion, and empathy, always lead with that. And then letting your clients know that you're not doing it to them or at them, but you're doing it for them. Hmm. So I'm not saying like, no, I'm not fitting you in because I don't want you in. It's like, no, you know what? I can't fit you in because I want you to have great hair that you're used to getting from me. And I'm not able to give that to you. And so I wouldn't feel comfortable. And I am going to have to say no so that when you do come in during the right time, I'm going to give you that quality you're expecting Mm because that wouldn't be fair to you to pay me and not get what I what you're used to getting. Yeah. And then when you phrase it that you're doing it for them, they understand not everyone. But there's going to be a better understanding of like, oh, you're not slamming a door in my face. You're actually protecting me. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I love that. Um, so guys, everyone who's watching, just, uh, I know I haven't really said hi yet, but jump into the comments, say hi, tell Dawn hi. We would love to hear from you. I want to know who's there. Just tell us your name, uh, where you're watching from. And if you have any questions for Dawn while we're chatting, please type them in because I know she would love to help you out. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, jump in. Um, and we already have Sergeet that's here. She says hi. And hi. Okay. Hi, Sergeet. So, um, okay. So we talked about like boundaries and how starting to set those boundaries and communicate better with your clients was kind of like the start for you from mm-hmm. like taking yourself to overworked to actually like turn it into a business that you were building that you had always probably dreamed of having. Um, mm-hmm. so you have a, um, podcast, if I'm not wrong, called the anxious creative. Is that right? I do. Yeah. So I love that name, the anxious creative. Cause I feel like it's something that we can all kind of anyone who's creative and who does creative work. Like, I feel like we can all kind of relate to that anxiety and confidence and that kind of thing. Can you talk about why, anxiety and confidence in business is such an important topic and kind of like theme in what you talk about a lot. Um, so anxiety, I just found like when I, I didn't know what anxiety was for the longest time. And I was always having this overwhelming fear that, you know, everyone was All my clients are going to leave me or the, the floor was going to fall out from underneath me. And then I ended up in, it was September 30th, uh, on August 30th, 2016, that I had a massive panic attack and I thought I was dying. I didn't know it was a panic attack. I ended yeah. up in the hospital. My limbs went numb. I felt like I couldn't catch my breath. Like I felt like I was drowning, like I couldn't get enough oxygen. Um, and it turns out to be a massive panic attack. And I had ta- I was throwing up all night long. And I reached out to uh, a lady who had done Reiki on me a couple weeks previous and asked her, like, was there any connection? And she said, well, interesting. Like, what were you thinking about? And the whole time I, like, wanted to pack up my bags, like, quit social media. Like I felt like complete, like an imposter. Like if anyone knew that I actually had no idea what I was doing, like (laughs) I'd be exposed for the complete fraud that I am. I wanted to reimburse tickets that I had sold for classes. Like I just felt like in over my head. Um, and she was like, interesting. So you're throwing up the whole night and that's what you're thinking about. And she's like, your solar plexus, um, is where your stomach is. And she's like, Mm -hmm. that's where your self-worth and your self-value lie. Hmm. And it was like, I purged that anxiety. And that's when I got really, I started to go through, you know, that was three years, three and a half years ago. So it's been a three and a half journey to where I am now and realizing that I'm not the only one feeling that way. And with social media, there's so much internal comparison that we don't even realize that we're doing Yeah. and seeing, you know, someone else get an opportunity that we hoped for, or, you know, seeing other people succeed and we want to be happy for them. And yet we still feel like, Like, I don't like this feeling I'm getting, but I'm actually happy for them. But at the same time, I don't like this feeling. Yeah. And so that's where it all kind of stemmed for and really realizing, like, I don't have to keep up with this whole facade. I can share openly about it. And when I started sharing openly, I realized I wasn't the only one feeling that way. And then the more open I was and honest about it, the less I felt like I had to put on this facade of, like, everything's perfect. Look at this amazing opportunity. Like, everything's great. Um, Like, my life is fabulous. I'm like, no, I want to show – I was going to say – can I swear? Of course. (laughs) Like I want to show the shitty sides of it. I want to be able to share with people the reality of Mm -hmm. life and not that it's going to be like airing dirty laundry and being a Debbie Downer, but the fact that it's not sunshine and roses, it's not all like golden opportunities um, and things like that. And realizing like there is a dark side to business because that's life. And there's not, there's, 
I'm human and I'm not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I totally relate to that. And I think that, like you said, it, a lot of it probably has to do with social media and our businesses being so present on social media. Now it's so hard not to compare our business mm-hmm. to other businesses. And I think that when you do that on a regular basis and you don't kind of check yourself, it just kind of piles up. And then you're essentially like building up your whole self-worth based on not even what your clients think of you, but what you think of you comparing yourself to another business. And I think it can be so totally. harmful. Yeah. And realizing like when I started sharing about my anxiety, people are like, I had no idea everything. Like, actually, I just had a message um, from someone recently being like, wow, like what a year 2019 has been for you. And I like start, I burst into tears because mm. I was like, I'm glad that it appears that way. But like on when well, I'm going to cry now, but like on a personal level, like I lost my dog. And that was like the worst thing. But like realizing like, I shared that even openly on social media and yet still the appearance to people is like everything is amazing because business is really great, which is awesome. And I'm really thankful for it. But like realizing the reality of the day to day of like, yeah, like things can look really great and really awesome. I'm not constantly sharing day to day about the sadness of losing my dog. Yeah. Um, And so it's interesting to like see people's perspectives and like what we think of our reality isn't what other people think of our reality. Yeah. Um, even though I like try to share very openly. So it's super interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so, it's so funny because like, I mean, we all are trying to promote and build our businesses on social media. So of course you, you want to present like the best and you want to like show all the pretty pictures and the bright side and things that people yeah. like to like. But at the same time, I think swings too far and it's just like we're so disconnected from the reality of what having a business is actually like and I feel like people like you that share kind of like sometimes those not so nice sides of it it's so refreshing and everybody can relate to it yeah everybody I mean the the emotional like psychological mindset side of having a business is more than 50 percent of it huge. It's like huge. It, yeah. It, it impacts what we do and how we show up and that kind of thing. So I, I love I, and I love and respect the fact that you're so honest about that kind of thing. Oh, thank you. I have this quote where I say our beliefs are like a compass and we head in the direction of what we think is possible. Mm-hmm. Cause I don't all, like, there's a lot of people who are like, believe it and you can achieve it or name it and claim it or like, you know, manifest it. And I'm like, yes, to a point. But my opinion is like, write it down, say it like it's happened is what it's, what that's going to do is point you in the direction to start taking steps. You still have to make the effort to get there. It's not going to like, I can't say like, I want an elephant. I want an elephant. I want an elephant. Now elephant's not going to show up on my front doorstep, but like maybe I'll like travel somewhere to where elephants are. You know what I mean? Like I'll still have to make the effort because I keep reminding myself of what I want. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know why I said elephant. That was a weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's unexpected, so you would have to imagine yeah. it. Um. So, <clears throat> can you tell us a little bit more about um what you're coaching your clients on right now? So, the things that you see are pretty common that the clients that you work with in the beauty industry that own their own business, what are some of the common things that they're kind of dealing with? Maybe it's mindset, maybe it's like customer communication and boundaries, that kind of thing. What are they kind of dealing with that's a common thing that you see? And then how are some of the ways that you're helping them? Yeah, so boundaries and communication are huge. And those are just two things that I'm really known for helping with mm-hmm. is and and through that work, like teaching um, business owners and stylists how to set healthy boundaries that isn't shutting people out of your business, but it's actually just showing them where to enter. Yeah, like it's not closing a door. It's showing them where the, the open door is. Um, by doing that, it actually builds up a lot of confidence in them. And so there's a lot of deep inner work without getting into like a big long tangent that we go into because, um, I, I wish I could just like give my students like do this, 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 and this. But if we don't work from the inside out first, um, then it's not going to work at all. So we go really like my, my signature program, Rock Your Business, is an mm-hmm. eight-week intensive mentorship coaching program that I do with students. And um, we go through it eight weeks. We start with building a foundation. Because, like, if you're building a house and you don't have a strong foundation, it might last a couple years and then it'll fall apart. Yeah. Which is great. And you see that happen. People start salons or they start their salon suite 
and they are thriving and they're doing awesome. And then all of a sudden they like are off the grid and you don't hear from them and you find out they totally crashed and burned Mm -hmm. where then you see other people who start slower and more methodically and then they'll be able, they can carry more weight. And so I always say, it's like building a house. You have to have a strong foundation. Otherwise, you know, you see some of these hundred year old homes still standing and great. And maybe they've had to do some renos and little tweaks, but they haven't had to rebuild the whole thing from yeah. scratch. So the ones who are like burning out and like, like you said, like you don't hear from them or they stop taking clients or they have to take time off. What is usually the problem there? I would say, well, it, everyone's different, right? But um, like when people, by the time, if people have gone through that and then they come to me, it's because they've been feeling like a slave to their business and their clients. Mm. They haven't been running their business. Their business has been running them. Yeah. And I always say like, you got into this because you wanted the freedom. And we, we laugh then because like everyone knows like you do have a certain amount of freedom where you can create what you want, but then there's this huge fear of scarcity and fear of everything going away and you got to trust that you, you know, it's going to be okay and setting those parameters and saying no, like when you worked in a salon as a commission stylist and someone phoned the reception and her schedule the receptionist didn't go, oh, well, let me go check and see if she'll stay late. Right. Right. They either found another time to come in or they didn't. Yeah. But because we didn't have that interaction, we didn't know about it. We didn't have necessarily have the fear, but we were always like, I always say like I was always booked and I was fine. But then all of a sudden when I went into business for myself and I was having that interaction and I felt like, well, if they don't, what if they don't come at all? I started bending the rules and I remind myself, I was fine when I worked and someone else said no. Or like that fear of taking money from a client thinking I'm taking it out of their pocket and putting it directly into mine. So I always coach my students like think of it as you're taking it from them. The business is taking it. The business pays its bills. Yeah. And if, there, and if there's anything left over, it goes in your pocket. Yeah. And so rather than feeling like you're taking, because that's the huge hang up is like, well, I'm just taking this money and putting it in my pocket. I'm like, mm-hmm. no, you've got to pay your bills. And Salon Scale is a really cool tool that people have been able to, it's their technology where they can actually find out the cost of their color. Oh, cool. Because all of a sudden when you realize like, oh, that color correction that I charged only $300 for, but it was like $100 worth of product. Like I'm not, I thought I was charging a lot, but I'm actually not. Yeah. So and so, a, so a people yeah. have a hard time like... I get it also has to do with uh, like the personal relationships that you have with your clients too. It's almost like you have to be able to kind of separate yourself from them and say, Hey, I have a business. I'm not trying to please everybody and make everybody my friend by doing everything they ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have this big dream about changing the industry and not me by myself, but I always share whenever I'm speaking with someone or I'm talking at an event, like, we got to band together as a community. And if we want to start being viewed and treated and respected like the professionals we are, let, let's do it. We got to do it together. We got to stay committed. We got to be accountable. We got to mm-hmm. stick together. But we got to start showing up like those respectable professionals yeah. so that people do respect us in return. Yeah. Um, but I have a big dream that we change the industry and how we're viewed by the rest of society and that we start viewing ourselves more like the professionals that we know we are and we want to be treated as. Um, and that starts with like really good consultations, which I have a mini program called Rock Your Consultation, teaching stylists how to communicate for success. So there's yeah. no misunderstandings. I love that. That is so awesome. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to jump into the comments quick. Um, hi, Amy. We've got Stephanie here. We have Cameron here. Kylie here is watching from hi guys. Sydney. Hi, guys. So drop into the comments if you're watching. And even if you're watching this as a replay, please let us know. Do you feel like in your business that you set good boundaries with your clients? Like if you don't, no judgment at all. If you do, that is amazing. I'm just curious to know how good do you feel like you are with setting boundaries or do you feel like it's something maybe that you need to work at? Um, I personally, I don't work one-to-one with clients anymore in my marketing business, but I did for two years and um, I actually have been like talking about this more recently. I had such a hard time setting boundaries with my clients because I was so afraid that I wasn't going to have many more. If I charged more, if I said no, I always had this fear because as a new business owner, you have this fear of like, oh, what if, what if I, what if the clients run out? What if they don't come back? That kind of thing. So same thing. Like I had this total, I would say, I would say like, okay, we have a half hour phone call. I'm going to do a consultation with you. And then it would end up an hour and a half. 
um, and that's my time and that's money. Um, or, you know, they would say, oh, but can you add this extra thing? And I would do it for free. And I had such a hard time with it. And I, I mean, I feel like it's something that business owners, like especially new business owners definitely struggle with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause we're scared of like, what about next month? What if no money comes in? And so yeah. I'll bend over backwards. And then you're like, I can't believe they asked that of me where we had the power to say no. But I used to think that the only answer to a question was yes. Yeah. And that's, that's codependency on my part. That's lack of boundaries. That's fearing that like I, I found my happiness through making other people happy, but then I'd walk away and I'd be frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know it's, it's so, but you really do have to treat it like a business. You have to treat yourself like a business owner and in some ways treat yourself like an employee as in like, like you said, if someone were to call the front desk and say, Hey, can Don come in and take me at like 10? Well, Don's over, Don, Don doesn't work past this time. So yeah. don't ask, don't, don't extend yourself more than you would for somebody else. And I, I ruffle a lot of feathers sometimes because I'm like, those clients that you're frustrated with that you're like, oh, like they, they make me stay late. I'm like, I hate to break it to you, but it's you. Yeah. And that's something you need to work with. And I get that people will push back and we get in this unconscious dance with people or when I like, oh, can you fit me in? Oh, well, let me look at my book. Oh, no, I have nothing. Oh, really? Can you squeeze me in? Well, let me check again. Yeah. Oh, well. And, you know, they, they learn the habit and it's all unconscious. And they're yeah. not, you know, there might be a couple that are purposely trying to manipulate you, but they've learned that if they ask you a second time, you have another look and you find a spot. Yeah. Yeah. And so you them trained in. them how to do it. Now, it's always easy. I always say the easy thing to do would be pack up, leave the city, start over new was exactly what I did. And you can start fresh with new people. And I joke (laughs) about that because it would be easier to start from scratch than to retrain your clients, but you can do it. It's hard and you will lose clients, but you'll make room for the ones that respect you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, um, I just wanted to jump into the comments here. Um, Sergi said, I can totally relate to this. It's sometimes really difficult to say no. Andrea says, I never used to, but I am much better now. I love boundaries, both for business and for personal. So really good point. It, it, mm-hmm. They go hand in hand. Totally. Um, Sergeet says, I say no now to staying after hours. Uh, Stephanie says, yes, if it ever gets to the point that I actually let them know that maybe it's not the right fit. I used to bend and it was never worth it. Since I made the switch and my clients are way happier, I bet. Oh, good. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, Amy says, I've been a tech now for 18 or 28 years. She's a nail tech. She said, it truly took me 20 years to set true boundaries. I remember using a black Sharpie to mark off my time and still write over it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, she says. Black was... Sharpie is a smart way to do it for your, keeping boundaries with yourself. Like, yeah. I can't put anything in the book. Yeah. Um, and she said, but I would still write over it. She wow. said it was hard, but creating strict boundaries, um, was a total game changer. And Denira is here. Hi, Denira. She says this applies for all businesses. I love it. Um, okay. Sergeet has to head off, but Sergeet, you can watch the rest as a replay. So, um, yeah, I, I love this topic about setting boundaries. And do you feel like, um, like the clients that you work with, do you also have to help them with how they communicate, um, boundaries, um, and communication when it comes to pricing as well? hundred percent. So I actually have a free download. If any of your people are interested yeah. in grabbing it, it's called raise your prices, not your anxiety. And it's an email template so that you can fill. It's kind of like a Mad Lib, fill it in so that it eases that anxiety of breaking the news to your clients mm-hmm. that your prices are going up. Um, but yeah, like, sorry, what was your original question? Yeah. About like, how do you help your coaching clients or do you see that something that they struggle with is setting boundaries and communicating properly about their pricing? Absolutely. Because people, what happens and what I see so oftentimes is people do a price increase and they kind of, they're nervous and they're scared to communicate it. So they throw it at their clients or they put it just at the bottom of their email. Like FYI, my prices are going up or they only do it through email. And the thing is, is that not everyone sees their email Yeah. and what a real, like I always say, like put yourself in the position of the client, like think of a service provider you go to and how would you want them to communicate a, a change in price to yeah. you? And when you think about it that way, like, would you just want to be surprised at the till? And then they're like, and you're like, oh, and they're like, well, didn't you get my email? 
Like, that doesn't feel good. Like, no, I didn't. Yep. Oh, well, I told you in an email. Mm-hmm. And even though we mean well, it's because we're nervous that we're coming across that way. How can we remember to lead with kindness, compassion, and empathy? Yeah. And so I did a really big price increase in February. And it's because my business model was changing. Everything was changing. And I let people know. And when pe- when you're, when you're anyone who's watching right now goes and downloads it, you can get it at donbradley.com slash prices. Okay, awesome. Um, it's a free download. But, um, and we'll put it in the comments as well, guys. Yeah. So what I said is like, as of this date, the prices are changing. I understand that that this means some of you may not be able to come see me anymore, Mm -hmm. like letting them know. Now, I don't think that has to be put in there, but if it's a significant price increase, it just lets people like off the hook because I don't ever want someone to come see me out of expectation or obligation. Yeah. I don't want them to feel trapped. Um, but letting them know, like, these are the changes. This is why I've loved having you in. I would love to continue to have you in if you have any questions or concerns. Also, I know change is hard. So let me know if you're confused about anything, because I also changed, like, what services I offer. Mm-hmm. If anything about this is confusing, please reach out. Let us know. We want to make this transition as easy as possible. Yeah. So, like, letting them know it's not just about a price change. Things are changing, giving them extra value, like, communicating value to them. Um, letting them know you're not doing it at them or to them, but you're doing it for them. Yeah. Kindness, compassion, empathy. And then also when they would come in, I would have a conversation with them face to face. Yeah. That was going to be my next question about like the in-person part. So what I say to them, I'm like, Hey, I just wanted to make sure, did you get my email about prices? And some of them are like, Oh no. Oh, okay. Well I sent one out. Maybe it went to your junk mail. Just wanted to let you know that my prices have changed since you've been here last. Um, that being said, like, I'd love to chat with you about it. And if there's like, I'm a flexible person. If they're like, oh goodness, I totally thought it was going to be this. If that's the case, like it's your choice. But what would make me feel good? Be like, okay, well, since you didn't see the email, I'll honor my prices previous, but just wanted to let you know, moving forward next time, it will be my new prices. Mm -hmm. And that way it's not like, once again, you're not doing it to them or at them, but you're doing it for them. Like I value you. I really love having you in. I want to continue to see you. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to feel any pressure about it because I know that sometimes this goes outside of your budget that's okay. It's not about, and I always say it's not about affordability. It's about budget. Yeah. Because people will find a way to afford the things they really want. Oh yeah, for sure. They just have to and, know ahead of time. You know, they have to be aware and essentially they have to be ready for it. Yeah. And pe- no one likes to get, th- you know, you wouldn't want to go to your favorite restaurant, order your favorite dish and all of a sudden it'd be way more and have no awareness. And yeah. now people, lots of businesses do that. And we still go back there because of necessity or need or whatever, but we're kind of disgruntled about it. Where because we're in such a relational business, Mm -hmm. it's really important um, on the relationship side of it to be able to communicate that. I also have it posted at my front desk at at the front so that they can see it still from February. I still have my prices there. Yeah. Yeah, Um, Just so people are aware and they remember. Because I don't post my prices online and that way my, but if my clients inquire, we send them to a website. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. So guys, um, pay attention because I love this idea. And I know that a lot of people have trouble kind of with their pricing and pricing increases. It always seems kind of awkward. So go to dawnbradley.com slash pricing. Prices. Prices. And um, you can download her cheat sheet where she's essentially going to give you some language that you can use to communicate if you do update your prices. Not if you do, when you do update your prices. (laughs) I'm going to make sure that's the correct link. Okay, let's get the right link. Um, And yes, so um, check that out. Go to John's website. You can find it. And I think that that's a great resource to have. Um, you know, Dawn's been in this industry for so many years. She knows, and she's doing it herself in her own business to way to lead with, you said, compassion, empathy, kindness, kindness. Yeah, kindness compassion, and empathy. Yeah. I love Always that. lead with that. And remember, communicate in a way that you're not doing it to them or at them, but you're doing it for them. Yeah. You're doing it for them because you need to be able to reinvest back in your business, into your education, your skills. The more that you improve as a business, the better your skills become, the better you can serve them, the better you can communicate with them. You can give them a better experience. So it's all, you know, it all goes back to the client anyway. Um, so can you tell me, Dawn, uh, some of the, you have an ebook that I downloaded that I absolutely loved called the client getting playbook. I thought it was so cool. It was so fun. Um, 
you talk about some ideas that have worked really well for you about um, going out and getting clients and essentially just being very confident and very communicative about what you do to build up your clientele. Um, can you tell us some of the things um, that some ideas that you have or maybe some of the things that you go through in the playbook um, for building up a clientele? Yeah, so it's the Client Attraction Playbook, and it has seven plays to getting fully booked. So it's your guide to fully booked. And the reason why I came up with this is because over the last 18 years, like, I started out in a salon. Um, I got annoyed with having to, like, wash bowls and sweep the floor and all of a sudden and wait for walk-ins. And all of a sudden, one day, I was like, I got to get over this shyness. And I, I'm like, I'm an introvert, and I am and I was shy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got to get over this if I want to actually start making money. Because I was sick of my $8 an hour I was making. And right. I think my first paycheck was $800 for the month. And rent was 300 of that. And I had to pay gas and get groceries, right? Like, right. I so you even, barely I, left with anything at the end. Yeah. I remember needing to get work clothes for work. And I was like, uh, I don't I can't. Um, so I was like, I need to, like... I realized, like, I'm in control of this. I could sit here and be frustrated at my boss or frustrated that not clients aren't coming in, but how can I actually get more people in? And so, you know, within by the time I was 21, I was the top earner in the salon I was at, which is pretty cool. Wow. And then I went over to the UK, and I built a clientele there. And then I moved to Australia, and I built a clientele there. And then I came back home, and some of my clients still waited around for me, and that, but I still had to rebuild a part of my clientele. And in 2010, I started my own business. I had to rebuild my clientele. And then 2014, I moved to Calgary, knew no one. And within 12 weeks, I was booked months in advance. That's awesome. And so I tell, I basically, because I got booked 12 weeks in, or within 12 weeks, months in advance, it was because of all those other times of building a clientele that each time I learned, okay, that doesn't work, but this does. Yeah. Okay, this does, and this does, but that doesn't. And this does, and this does, and this does, but that doesn't. So by the time I built, it's not that I got like, lucky or like some magical unicorn fairy that like got like everything happened. I put in, I put in some hard work when I had no one in my chair. I mm -hmm. still showed up eight hours a day to build my clientele. Yeah. So I tell people like, if you don't have a clientele at all, still show up and work for eight hours a day, but I'll give you exactly what to do in this playbook so that you don't have to go through the trial and error of doing things that don't work. Yeah. And the playbook playbook works either online and social media or in real life, because I know some places like some rural areas, social media is not really going to help you. Right. Um, and things like that. But that being said, it works both ways. And I've taken the error out of the trial and error. Yeah. You. Can you tell us like maybe one or two ideas that you give in the playbook so we can tease it and then get people to download it? Yeah, I would love absolutely. if you can share some ideas. So one of them is like, just start talking to strangers. You got to start talking to strangers. That's the only way. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to get, you've got to get out of your own way. And like, I, I stuttered, I st like, I stumbled over my words. I remember clear as day, I was in IGA, or Sobeys now it's called, mm -hmm. I was getting groceries, and I was 19 years old. And I, I had seen this clerk, and she had beautiful hair. And I was like, Oh, I just need to like, I just got to do it. And I was like, deep breath. And I like, didn't give myself like, the chance to hesitate. And I was like, I know this might seem really awkward and weird, but I really like your hair. And I'm a hairstylist. And Here's my card. And it was so awkward. <laughs> but at least I did it. Yeah, right? of course. Because it's like, you have to suck at something in order to get better at it. Yeah. And then each so, time, I guess it becomes a little less awkward. Yeah. And so like, if we judged ourselves, like we, I see this happen so often as hairstylists try something once, they're not good at it, they feel embarrassed, and they don't ever try it again. Mm -hmm. And the guaranteed, ask anybody you admire who's in a place where you want to be and ask them about their beginning. Ask them about their very first time doing something, doing yeah. whatever it is. And they'll probably tell you a story of failure. But people think failure and success are opposite, but failure is part of the process to success. Mm -hmm. And so learning to talk to strangers was really hard. And I even got out of the habit of it for a while because then I got a full clientele and I was fine. And I didn't really, because one of the steps later on in the playbook is getting your clients talking for you. Yeah. The first, the first four steps in the playbook are the hard work. And then the last three steps are making it work for you so you yeah. don't have to work, which is pretty cool. Um, but there was just like a year ago where I'm like, I'm out of the habit. I haven't talked to a stranger in a while because I've been having referral business and like everything else has been working like a well-oiled machine. So knowing that once you build a clientele, once you know how to do it once, it kind of runs itself. Yeah. But I, was like, I just got to do it. And so we were, at, we were at a pub. I was with my boyfriend and I like got all nervous again because you get out of practice. 
And I would say it's like lifting weights. Like you can, I'll get fit and then I'll be like, cool, I'm good. I'll stop lifting weights. And then you lose your fitness. Hmm. Yeah. And then you go to lift that weight that you would been able to. And you're like, I can't anymore. And the same thing with growing a clientele. So you have to remember there's like maintenance to it. And I struggle with maintenance Mm -hmm. on anything, but it gets easier. And the more you maintain it, the more you keep that strength and capacity. Yeah. So essentially just kind of getting out of your comfort zone and getting comfortable with just on a regular everyday basis going and talking with people, just introducing yourself. Like what kind of things do you say? So you would say things like, I love your hair. Like I would love to do it. Do you kind of sometimes just say, Hey, you seem like a nice person. Like I just wanted to say hi and tell you what I do. That kind of thing. Yeah. Like, and when like an online way I've done it is like, I always say like, if you're at a party and someone like comes up to you out of the blue and is like, go on a date with me, you'd be like, what? Like that's, even if they're like really attractive, you'd be like, that's kind of random and weird. And the same thing, like, don't just go to someone on the street or in their DMS and be like, I want to do your hair. Like it's abrasive. Um, but if you like, if you were at a party and like you saw someone walk in and they made eye contact with you across the room and then all of a sudden they're like in the like food line with you and they're like, Hey, I like your sweater. And you're like, Oh, thanks. Whatever. And you kind of chit chat. And then you like see them later on. And at the end of the night, they're like, Hey, I'd love to take you on a date. It wouldn't be so weird. Exactly. And so I always tell people that same thing, like don't stalk people, but, (laughs) um, like kind of get, no, get familiar with them. And then also, like, if, if it's online, that's what I did. I'd, like, like people's pictures. I'd comment on them. I'd come around, like, a couple. I would, like, make a list of different accounts of people who are, like, clients, like, people that I think I would do their hair really well. Mm-hmm. I'd make a list of their accounts, and then I'd go back to them a couple days, and then at the end of a week, I'd shoot them a DM and be like, hey, totally love your stuff. You seem super fun. Love your style. I actually have so many cool ideas for your hair. I'm a hairstylist. I don't know if you have a hairdresser and if you do, I'm not trying to poach you at all. I don't believe in that. But if you're ever looking for one, I would love to do your hair because I already have so many cool ideas. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. And it's really genuine too. Like it's not something that you're like, Oh, I need to like and comment on as many things as possible. It's like people who you genuinely would love to have as clients and you're just mm-hmm. kind of introducing yourself and talking to them and it might not always work out. I'm sure it doesn't always work out, but like you said, it's just kind of like a muscle that you need to get in the habit of like yeah. exercising and get ready for rejection. That's part of it. Yeah. And just because it you're going to get work, rejected more than you get accepted. Yeah. And just because it, it, just if it doesn't work like the first time or if you've done it a few times and it seems to not work, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. Like you said, it's a muscle. You need to do it a few times. It's not mm-hmm. always going to work, but that doesn't mean that it can't be an amazing strategy for you. And the cool thing that happened to me is I had a girl reply and she's like, oh, thank you so much. I actually have a hairdresser that I love, but your stuff looks amazing. And I'll definitely send my friends and family. And I was like, oh, thank you. And then six months later, she came in and she's like, oh, my hairstylist left. So then there you go. Those rejections you get still might turn into clients down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Um, So I just wanted to jump into the comments. Amy says that she has rebuilt her business three times. So she gets you, she understands. It's like you work at it, you know how to rebuild your business and then you can repeat it if things change and you end up in a new city like you did. Absolutely. And confidence is huge. Like the first time you build a clientele is scary because you're still like new and you're nervous, but confidence sells. So the more you can build confidence in yourself by having a coach or a mentor or Mm -hmm. something or having other stylists help you out, the more confident you are, the more people are going to believe your confidence. Cause if I come to you and say like, Hey, like, do you want to come get your hair done by me? Like I'm like, most people are leave happy or <laughs> right. Or like sometimes they leave happy or yeah. if I'm like, Oh my goodness, I have so many cool ideas and I would love to do your hair because your hair is the type of hair that I really excel at. Yeah. I'd love to have you in my chair. It's not cocky. It's confident. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. I love that. Um, and then Stephanie says, can you put the playbook in the comments for after? I definitely will. Stephanie, I'll reply back to your comment with the link for that as well. The playbook is awesome. Um, Jessica says building a clientele is legit like dating <laughs> in so many ways. And so I actually have a process now. I got to a point where I was getting so many new clients that I started uh, mandatory consultations. Mm -hmm. And then I was getting so, and I wasn't charging for them. And I was getting so many consultations back to back that one day, two and a half hours was just consultations. And so I tried to slow down and my regulars couldn't get in. And I was like, okay, a new client's like a 50, 50 chance if like they'll come back. Cause you just don't know if you're going to connect with them. They'll like the way you do hair. And so I tried to slow down my business so that I could make room for my regulars. Cause 
my regular couldn't get in, they'd go somewhere else, I'd lose them. This new person was like a 50-50 chance. Yeah. Or wouldn't it be better to like keep this person tried and true that I know will come back? So I started charging for my consultations to dissuade new people. It actually had the opposite effect because um, people love exclusive shit. Right. And so I was like harder to get to. And I was like, that was like an accidental marketing thing I did, which is crazy. Um, but it worked really well. It was like charging for consultations. What it did is it actually weeded out the people before they even booked in with me that weren't right for me. Right. That's cool. Someone's not going to pay me for a consultation. And I'm not saying everyone should charge for consultations. But what it did is they did their research on me before they booked that. And yeah. they found out what kind of hair I did, what kind of person I was. Do they think that we'd connect? They also listened to me and respected me more. Hmm. Yeah, it's true. When people pay, they pay attention. That's what they always say, and it's so true. Yeah. You value something different when you pay for it versus yeah. when it's just... How much were you charging for them? $50. And wow. it didn't apply. Like That was just for my time. Um, but what a lot of my students do is they charge for the consultation and then it applies on the appointment if they choose to book. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Um, and, and then so if you're, no, go okay. ahead. I always say like, once you're at a point where you don't need new people, I would really, really encourage people to charge for it mm -hmm. and charge for your time. Cause you're showing people, it's not just about the product you're using. It's about who you are and the skills and talents you provide and the knowledge and wisdom that you have. Yeah. Um, now I charge a hundred dollars, um, for a half an hour consultation. Okay, cool. So, and then how did you end up solving the problem with not having enough room for your regular clients to be coming in? Yeah, so well, I was getting so many consultations that I started limiting how many consultations I'd have a week. Okay. Yeah. That and then as sense. like I've I always tell people like don't be scared to raise your prices. I've raised my prices multiple times over the last 5 years here in Calgary and I've shed my clientele and rebuilt it four or five times in the last 5 years. Hmm. Because as I grew and as my business grew, I outgrew some of my clients and yeah. I outgrew some of their budgets. It's not, it's not personal. And I started to learn to be like, I love them. I would love to continue to see them, but I'm not going to hinder my business growth based on wanting to cater to someone's budget mm -hmm. because their budget could change just from what this is. Yeah. And so I continued to grow and expand my clientele and I got pushback and I probably people are angry because they love to see me. And if it was no longer in their budget, they want to make that my fault, not theirs. Yeah. Or just that they didn't value hair as much. That's okay. Like, I don't expect hair to be people's number one priority. Yeah. Um, but I lost a lot of people. So each time a price increase came, I lost people, which then made room for those new consultations and have be able to take people on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true, though. Like as you were kind of progressing as a business professional, as a hairdresser, you were able to raise your prices and then maybe you attract a different type of clientele. And that's OK. It, it's more Absolutely. in line with who you're at in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, and I it's usually it. like we usually grandfather people in, which I'm not against either, but we fail to tell them about the changes that have happened because we're too scared to ruffle a feather. So we won't tell them that I have a price mm -hmm. increase. I'll just keep letting them pay. And then three years down the road, you're losing money on their appointment because you've been too scared to tell them about your four price increases you've had. And you know that you could have someone, you've got people lined up at the door wanting to see you, but your books are full, wanting to pay your new prices. Yeah. And you're still catering to these people because you love them, which is a really admirable thing. But you need to step back and be like, is that what a smart business owner does? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's not necessarily the easy choice. It's not the one that would come the most naturally. But when you start taking yourself seriously as a business professional, you really need to start making kind of those maybe uncomfortable choices that in the long term are right for you. Absolutely. And I'm not saying like, don't have like a day where you can come in and do your mom and your sister's hair. But like if you're giving people and I'm not saying don't give discounts, but if you're giving discounts because out of fear of their pushback, that's not the right reason. Mm -hmm. If you're giving discounts because you care for people and you want to gift them something, then there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Guys, um, for those of you who are watching and if you're watching as a replay, jump into the comments and let me know how you've kind of dealt with price increases in your business. Do you feel like you've been putting them off a little bit? longer than maybe you should? Do you feel like, no, no problem. I do it every few months or every year and I'm fine with it. Do you feel like you still haven't done the price increases that you probably need to do? Just again, no judgment. I'm just curious. And I'm, I want to know, you know, if maybe some of Dawn's tips have been helpful for you because I love, love, love all this advice that she's giving. So just jump into the comments and let us know. Um, and then one final question I wanted to ask you, Dawn, um, what kind of lessons have you learned in your business? Like the most important lessons that you think that you've learned when it comes to your mindset and your confidence in the past few years? The importance of self-care for mm -hmm. sure. 
um, and to keep my eyes on my own lane, right? Like stop. I got to stop the scroll. I like I my business thrives when I am not on social media consuming it. So stop consuming and be okay. Honestly, this is I don't know if this really applies, but like I've muted a lot of good friends on Hmm. social media and it's not out of not um, wanting to celebrate them or supporting them. It's because it leaves me with this panicky feeling and this fear feeling. And then I don't make the wisest smart decisions. I make decisions out of fear and scarcity and wanting to rather than doing the things that I actually want to do that make set me apart. Because what I see happen to so many people is they see success happen for someone and then they try to mimic that for them, but it doesn't work because it's not about this thing they did. It's about who they are. And so show up as yourself and do things your own weird, quirky way and do it and don't wait for permission or wait for someone else to do it first so that you can do it. Be the trailblazer in that. Do it your own way and stop, stop looking at other stuff. So I have to really like stop the scroll, stop watching other people. Um, and it, once again, like I'll communicate to friends be like, Hey, just so you know, like I fully support you causes it's nothing about you. And I want to celebrate you and please let me know still. But for right now, I just can't be consuming things because it's causing me some anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's causing me some stress and I'm not giving into my business. So what I just started doing is I don't look at my phone for the first two hours of work each day. I love that. Um, I don't even want to, I don't even look at my phone in the morning. So I'll like let my alarm go off because as soon as I get distracted, my brain's not in the right path. Yeah. And you might still have the similar idea as someone else at the end of the day, like, there's like 6 billion people on the planet. There's no original thought anymore, but just get focused on your own shit. Yeah. I love that. And that's something that I've definitely been dealing with too. And I think that all of us have is just like balancing how we, how we use and how we view social media. And like I, like we talked about at the very beginning, it's like, it turns into this comparison game. And when you start comparing your business to other people, you're thinking more about yourself and your ego and your fears rather than the people that you want to help and reach and talk to. Mm. Um, so I think that that's great. And I also love the tip of not looking at your phone for the first two hours, because I started to kind of do that, like with my emails, I don't check them or respond to anything until the end of the day um but essentially like i get it because when you, you look can be at, on your emails all day long yes and when you look at your phone and you get pulled into it you're not concentrated on okay today i have to get this done you let other mm-hmm. things control where you're spending your time and energy and it's just it doesn't work so i love that idea that's awesome Thank you. Um, so I wanted to um, jump into the comments and see what people wrote about um, pricing. So Jessica says, emotional discounts used to hinder me so badly. Um, she says, I am definitely scared to raise my prices. I'm not sure if I can shed clients yet. How do I know when it's time? To let go of clients or when it's time to raise your prices? When it's tri- time to raise her prices, I think. I say if you're booked more than 80%, for two weeks um or some people will say four weeks then it's time right yeah you just know by how busy you are and if you're ready yeah. to go to the like next if, level or if you're fully booked and people are or people are wanting to get squeezed in and can't get in when they want like this is my this is all my opinion so disagree with it agree with it your choice but if people can't get in within two weeks with you then it's time to raise your prices. Hmm. Now, I've been in situations in my salon where people couldn't get in for three months, but I lost a lot of missed business and missed opportunity. And I think great having people rebook and stuff. So, you know, but I think there should always be room for that person who wants to get in next week. Yeah. And so I know that's scary because people would rather look at their schedule and see it full. But think of how many times you get someone asking like, oh, is there any availability And so I decided, and once again, this is just my opinion, and this may disagree with other people's thoughts and method of business, but I want to make sure that there is room. I've got like 10 to 15% openings in two weeks from now. Okay. So be be booked for for, you know, fully this week and Mm -hmm. most of next week, but I want to have some openings in the third and fourth week. I want to be majority booked, but I want to have, oh, I want to make sure there's openings. So if you're fully booked three weeks to four weeks in advance, it's time to raise your prices so that you can let go of some of those. You're not letting them go, but people will, you know, and it's not personal. It could be that, you know, they've got kids in sports and they only have this much money for their Mm -hmm. hair and that they they would love to see you still, but they just can't. Yeah. Um, Or like, you know, there's different priorities or 
and center, like people's finances change. This is, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but when I have a few one-on-one coaching clients that I do, 